So I'm going to talk in three parts. I don't have a lot of time today, but I'm going to talk about renewable energy in general and where geothermal fits into that. I want to spend a bit of time talking about heat pumps, and I probably won't get to the third topic, which is enhanced geothermal systems, which is kind of the future and where we expect uh, geothermal energy to go in the future. So talking about renewable energy first, you've been talking about that all week, I'm sure. Um, in the last 10 years, this is the United States uh, renewable energy output since way back when. But most importantly, what you can notice is the change that occurred in around 2005, 2006, with a very prominent increase of total renewable energies. And you'll notice also, too, the light blue bars in here is hydro. And hydro has, for many, many years, been the principal form of renewable energy, although um, from the point of view of legislation, it's not actually counted. And we won't talk about why that is. It doesn't count as renewable energy. But you will see in here a general trend that hydro has, in fact, been declining over a, quite a long period of time. And the other renewables are coming up and have, in fact, are soon to surpass hydro uh, in t the total energy mix. But among the renewable energies, in fact, among all energies, they have different characters. And uh, the prominent characteristic of wind and solar, as you certainly know, uh, and many others as well, is that they are intermittent. So they are intermittent on different time scales. The, the, um, the sun, of course, rises and sets every day, so it's on a 24-hour time scale. Uh, the wind also depends on where you are. In California, we also have more or less a 24-hour cycle for wind, but in addition, we have a cycle which depends on the season. We have windier times of the year and calmer times of the year. And actually, hydro is also um, intermittent in that we have drought years, which we've had for the last five years in California, and years where it rains a lot, like it did recently in Houston. So um, all of those legitimate and very useful sources of energy have that as one of their characteristics, not uh, that it cannot be overcome, but that it does need to be overcome. Geothermal is, is different in its characteristic in that it is basically base load that we can take uh, steam and hot water from the ground, we can turn it into electricity 24 hours a day and 365 days a year. That would seem to be a good thing, and 10 years ago it was. Actually, it turns out not to be such a good thing anymore for reasons that we'll talk about uh, a little later. Uh, so geothermal has a, has a possibility for substitution, sort of direct substitution for some of these older, dirtier kinds of uh, electricity sources that I have here on the right. I'm talking mostly about electricity, but not completely here today. I'll talk about other kinds of energy later on. Worldwide, geothermal energy has been growing. So every five years, we have a World Geothermal Congress. It's kind of like the Geothermal Olympics. And one of the functions of that con Congress is to do a worldwide inventory of where the resources are. So this is the most recent one, which was done in 2015. And you can see also to a projection, everybody talks about what they're currently building to get to five years ahead. So shown here is the actual installed capacity, which are the diamonds, and then the square ones are the actual generation. Those, of course, are not always the same. Uh, for geothermal, they typically are because we have a very high load factor, 95%. But for wind and solar, you may have a 100 megawatt wind farm, which on average generates only 30. Uh, but you can see here the total uh, worldwide in 2015 was about 13 gigawatts, and the projection projects under construction in the world, taking us to 22 gigawatts worldwide. So the nations of the world that are generating electricity from geothermal energy are these and many more off to the right. And rather surprisingly to many people, the US is number one. And as it happens too, actually were California to be a nation, which we kind of consider ourselves to be, uh, <laughs> We would still be number one. So California actually generates more electricity from, or has more installed capacity for geothermal than any other nation on the planet. But you can see um, several other important nations here too. 
Obviously, um, at the current stage, geothermal energy is associated with the so-called ring of fire, which goes around the Pacific. So a lot of the Central American countries, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Mexico, all of, they, all of those, Chile, all of those have geothermal energy too, Japan, New Zealand. And then over in the um, other parts of volcanically active parts of the world, Mid-Atlantic Rift, Iceland, um, over to the East African Rift, Kenya, Ethiopia, uh, and somewhat off track, uh, Italy and Turkey also. But you can see here that the totals and the order that they were in in 2015. What's important and interesting about this graph is how rapidly it's changing. You can see here Turkey was uh, number nine in 2015. Turkey has already surpassed Iceland in, in the two years since 2015. And Kenya has also surpassed Iceland in that period of time. I, I spent a sabbatical last year in Japan, and they were mortified to have gone from you know, number nine to be number 11. Uh, different scale here, but here are some of the other countries that I mentioned too that are generating electricity from uh, geothermal. What's interesting about this graph is, n is not the sort of the, the geologically uh, expected ones, but some geologically unexpected ones. So you can see here Germ Germany, Austria, Australia. Uh, these are countries which are not volcanically active, and, and those are examples of so-called enhanced geothermal systems of continental scale uh, developments which is likely to be one of our futures. A similar graph which now shows progression over time. Each one of these colored bars is a five-year interval going from left to right. And you can see that for the most part, there are several countries that are expanding very rapidly on a five-year scale. And I've marked the significant ones right there, including us. The United States has been building quite a lot of geothermal uh, power plants since 2008. The principal reason for that was legislative production tax credit, which was formally applied only to wind and solar, was applied to all renewables. Just at the end of the, um, the, 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 the uh, George Bush administration that came into uh, operation, 0.9 cents per kilowatt hour was a tax credit, and that actually uh, caused a big expansion in all renewable energy development, including geothermal. So I'm going to show you three snapshots of the state of California, 2010, 2013, and 2015, um, showing the various <laughs> renewable energies as a fraction of, this is a total generation too. So this is no longer installed capacity, but actual generation. Bought my own laser pointer. That one doesn't work either. <laughs> I have two. <laughs> here we go. So you can see here in the percentages. So in the year 2010, total generation in the state of California was 28.8% renewable, including hydro which again, legislative is actually excluded. Uh, and we'll come and look at some of these other numbers. I interestingly, in the context of renewable energy, you'll see solar and wind at that time was significantly left in 2010. I also want to pay attention to the fact, 6%, this is all electricity generated in the state. The state of Nevada also generates 6% of its electricity from geothermal. And that's significant in general to the industry and to society because the resources in the state of Nevada are kind of moderate. They are low temperature. They're rather more difficult to, to develop than those in California where we have much higher temperatures. Typical resource in California has a 250 centigrade, degree centigrade resource temperature. The more average temperature in Nevada is 150 degrees centigrade. So technologically, uh, Nevada is sort of pushing the limit in terms of development. They also have a very strong uh, commitment, including you know, both the Democratic and Republican uh, 
legislators to push for geothermal energy. The governor of the state of Nevada last week was pushing for a budget increase for geothermal energy in the decimated budget of Department of Energy. So this was a typical day in 2015. Um, and I don't know if you can see the light blue, a light green bar that shows wind and solar on that particular day. This was May 24th. And on that particular moment of the day, this is around lunchtime, the state was producing 38% of its energy from renewable sources, excluding hydro. Okay, so this is wind, solar, geothermal, and others. So you can see in here, uh, here's geothermal. So in, in California, most of the time the wind blows at night, which is a good thing because it kind of backfills the solar. Not always, but often. And of course, solar in the daytime. Here is geothermal, which on that particular occasion was generating about 1,050 megawatts. Okay, so looking at that graph, it only goes up as far as lunchtime, but of course the solar comes down again. How much total energy in the day was generated by each of those sources? Which one do you think was number one? You know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> so this was the total for the 24-hour period. Here is solar, 25.5, wind, 25.1, geothermal was 26,000 megawatt hours on that particular day. So the fact that it's sort of continuous and goes all of the time actually is an important characteristic that allows it to be uh, a controllable and you know, reliable dispatch to the state of California. Coming to 2013, you can see how rapidly the energy picture is changing here in the state as it is in many other places too. So here's geothermal again, 12.3 for the year. Uh, 2013 was the first year in which wind in total for 365 days exceeded uh, geothermal. Here is solar, which in 2013, not that long ago, you can all remember 2013, solar was uh, about 25%. Come forward to 2015, here is geothermal, it's still basically the same, still at 6%. Here is wind, which is also about the same as it was in 2013. And here is solar at 15,000 uh, megawatt hours for the year. And in 2017, it's probably another 50% more than that again. So solar is coming up like crazy in the state of California. One of the consequences of that is that we are now um, on a typical summer day actually curtailing uh, electricity generation in the state because at lunchtime we have too much electricity. So those of you who have an electric car, plug it in at lunchtime because otherwise we're throwing electricity away. And I mentioned before that one of the characteristics of geothermal is that it is base load. Base load is no longer good. The California ISO that controls electricity in the state was delighted when they shut down San Onofre nuclear power plant because that gave them 1,000 megawatts of electricity that they had to take all of the time. And that was a significant problem in terms of the total electricity that they had to dispatch. We no longer need baseload uh, electricity in the state of California and most other places too. What we need is fast ramping power. So come 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the state of California needs 13 gigawatts to come online by 6 p.m., which is when the peak uh, consumption is. So for those of you who are interested in energy research, which I know many of you are, or business, what we need for the future is fast ramping power sources and energy storage. We need a way to capture and hold that solar power so we can use it at the time that we need it. Uh, other countries are generating a lot of geothermal energy too. This is New Zealand, which is my original home country. New Zealand is 80% renewable electricity, including hydro, and currently at about 25% geothermal. Uh, this is Iceland. This is actually not electricity, but all primary energy. This is all energy consumed in the nation of Iceland, which you can see up here is um, about two-thirds geothermal. It's really cold in Iceland, and they use geothermal not only for electricity, but for direct use, which is what I want to talk about now. So we don't have to make electricity. There are lots of 
other sources of uh, or, or requirements for energy that can use heat directly, all of them listed right there. And this is a very interesting graph that I hope you will ponder for a moment. This shows in the United States all of the uses of thermal energy for space heating, air conditioning, factories, industry, etc. And what you can see over here, it's plotted as a function of the temperature at which it is used. And you can see this big old bar right here, a huge fraction of the energy, thermal energy that's used in the United States and most other country, industrial countries too, is used between 40 and 60 degrees centigrade. That's just basically the temperature of the hot water that comes out of your tap, more or less. So we don't have to have, how do we generate most of that hot water that comes out of the tap in your house? We burn natural gas at 1200 degrees centigrade and we heat water to 40. That's stuffed. Okay, we have lots of places where geothermal hot water comes out of the ground at 40 degrees centigrade. We just put it through the tap and we don't have to um, take a high quality energy and turn it into a low quality energy. And that's of course what they do in Iceland and many places too. This is one of my favorites, balneology. So a lot of use for geothermal water directly for bathing uh, and also for space heating. Picture at the top left was the uh, city of Reykjavik in 1930 where it was fueled by coal. There's no coal in Iceland, all that coal came from Norway, gave them black smoke. This is the city of Reykjavik today. 80% uh, of the nation of, of Iceland heated by geothermal energy. And worldwide, this is where direct use of geothermal energy is, is applied. The big blue bar on the right hand side, which is the interesting one to us, is heat pumps, geothermal ground source heat pumps, which is kind of the, you know, the, the use anywhere technology. You don't have to have volcanism to have a geothermal heat pump. And, and again, showing the five year cycle, heat pumps is number one on the left hand side. You can see how rapidly geothermal heat pump application has expanded over the last 20 years worldwide. And looking at all of the nations of the world where that technology is used, there are some surprises in there. Number one is China. Uh, US is number two in, in uh, direct use of geothermal as well. Uh, number three is Sweden. Who would think about Sweden as a geothermal country? But it is big, principally with the use of heat pumps. Switzerland, many other countries use them too. Let me skip this one. You guys been to SESI yet? Yeah. Isn't that great? So those big orange things that are in there behind the glass wall, those are heat pumps. And in fact, they are the world's largest commercially available heat pumps. There are three of them there. And what they take, they do, as you know, they take the excess thermal energy coming back with the chilled water and they put it back into the circulating hot water. Now, you've seen this graph too, talking about SESI. So SESI, the campus overall between over the 365 days of the year has a heating and a cooling load which are basically in balance. The total number of kilojoules that get put out as heat also gets sucked up as cool for your air conditioning to make you more feel comfortable. And what those heat pumps do is they recycle those kilojoules and put them from one flow into the other. The problem is that during the summer and winter, we have different requirements. So um, up here in the summertime, as we are now, every day they're running cooling towers over there to dissipate the additional heat, which we all generate. Uh, and during the wintertime, they actually burn natural gas over there to heat up the circulating hot water. Phase two of SESI is planned to use ground source uh, geothermal application. So instead of throwing away that energy in the summertime, it will be put into the ground under the campus. And during the winter time, uh, uh, additional ground source heat pumps will pull it back out again, and then we will no longer need to burn natural gas. Um, most of you are new to campus. Have they taken you on treasure hunts yet? That's always a good thing for new students. Those of you organizing treasure hunts for next year's new students, find the geothermal well on campus. There are three. Actually, one of them is within 100 meters of us. So you can see if you can find that geothermal well um, to amuse your friends over the weekend. So <laughs> over everything worldwide, heat pumps, electricity, etc., 
This is the actual total generation and its consequences to carbon emissions worldwide. In terms, first of all, for electrical generation and as direct heat, these are sort of equivalents, tons of oil um, equivalent which are avoided, tons of CO2 which are avoided, etc. So the consequence in general overall of all of that is about three days of worldwide oil equivalent consumption which is not huge, but it's not small either. It is certainly worth having and certainly worth working hard to sort of do better and more. So what are we doing? I'll talk about geothermal at Stanford. We have a geothermal research group here that uh, Tom mentioned in starting called the Stanford Geothermal Program. These are our students. Um, and the focus of our research, we are engineers, we're in the Department of Energy Resources Engineering, and the focus of research in geothermal here at Stanford is what you see listed at the bottom, fracture characterization for enhanced geothermal systems. Enhanced geothermal systems are those which don't exist naturally where the ground is actually stimulated to pass water through rock which is hot but not permeable. And that's sort of the future and general focus of geothermal research actually in many places. Um, there's more pictures of some of our students down here at the bottom. I mentioned the World Geothermal Congress. On that occasion, we gathered together as many as were present uh, alumni of the Stanford Geothermal Program too. So that is all of us. So in summary, the last 10 years, geothermal has been around a long time. We've been producing electricity since 1904, more than 100 years. But the last 10 years has been sort of a revival and renewal of interest in geothermal because of the general interest in climate change and renewable energy everywhere. And a lot of countries uh, have expanded a lot. I mentioned Turkey and Kenya uh, in very significant ways. New technologies like those used in the state of Nevada to capitalize on resources which are lower quality and heat pumps which we can use everywhere. Uh, nobody should have a gas-fired furnace in their houses. Uh, we should all have heat pumps instead. Why don't we? Basically, I don't know the answer to that, but shortage of plumbers is probably the principal reason. <laughs> because, I'm, I'm serious, plumbers know how to put gas-fired heaters in. They don't know how to put geothermal heat pumps in, therefore they, they do the former. And then enhanced geothermal systems. If we can get it to work, it's a technology under development, would allow for geothermal everywhere. So with that, let me conclude and invite your questions. We also have a class, Energy 269, Geothermal Energy. This is a field trip to the geysers. Questions? Uh, you mentioned the like, of simulations to enhance how much overlap is there technologically with hydraulic fracturing? Uh, it is hydraulic fracturing. We are clever in geothermal. We refer to it instead as hydro shearing. Um, and in fact, there, there are some, the technology is very similar. It's pressurizing the rock to produce a fracture. Um, the difference, however, is in fact that uh, the principal mode of fracturing in hydrocarbons is so-called mode one fracturing, where you kind of tear the rock apart you actually pressurize and push the rock to fracture it. Uh, volcanic rocks are much more brittle than sedimentary rocks, and therefore, uh, and they also tend to be naturally fractured, at least with cleats and sort of weaknesses. They tend to shear before they get torn apart, so so-called mode two fracture. So there is some differences. There's certainly some similarities too. Um, but there are some examples. The state of Oregon, for example, banned fracking for oil and gas, but they didn't ban fracking for geothermal. Do you think it would horizontal drilling systems? No. Uh, horizontal drilling is much too expensive to drill in volcanics, so most of the wells are vertical. We got anybody here from political science? No? I, I don't actually know why. I think my guess, and I don't, I'm, I'm making this up actually, but my guess is that in the days when renewable energy was first sort of 
promoted heavily in the 1970s. There was already lots of hydropower. And so they wanted incentives and whatever for people to generate renewable energy with wind and solar, like the you know, Palm Springs wind farms, et cetera. And so the hydro people said, oh, you know, we want some of those incentives too. And so there was legislated, they were struck off, said, okay, no, you're not renewable. We're gonna give the money to those other people. But quite legitimately, I mean, hydropower is absolutely renewable, rains, but not in politics. There's another question in the way in the back. So there have been some concerns about geothermal energy in the sense that it can lead to surface instability, uses heavy amount of water, and can bring harmful gases up towards, towards the atmosphere and towards the surface. Uh, can you please discuss the veracity of these and the steps taken to mitigate these effects? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, anybody ever drunk Perrier water? Perrier water, of course, is naturally carbonated water, CO2 dissolved in it, like Coca-Cola, comes out of the ground. I mean, that geothermal water has dissolved in it gases like CO2 and hydrogen sulfide. And most of the plants like this one in uh, the geysers in California, they discharge that gas to the atmosphere. The fraction, so, so geothermal is not absent of CO2 emissions. But as I showed you before, the avoidance of CO2 in comparison, for example, to coal or, or even natural gas, it's, it's about a fraction of like 5%. But more importantly, in the resources in Nevada, they're generated using a so-called binary cycle where the hot water never sees the atmosphere at all. So water goes through heat exchanges, it exchanges to a hydrocarbon phase which runs the turbine, and all of the hot water, including the gases, goes back into the ground. So there is no emissions of, of any kind in, in that kind of plant. I think I get time for one more question in the center. Um, I noticed on one of your slides there was a bar graph that showed uh, each country's um, I'm not sure if it was use of uh, renewable energy and that it showed that the US was yeah. Yes. So um, that's a good question. So in the although we classify, you know. Hydro is not classified as renewable, even though it is. Geothermal is classified as renewable, even though it isn't. So actually, the point about geothermal is that in this, the way that we generate power from geothermal sources nowadays, we, we're taking water from the ground, we're extracting the kilojoules to make electricity, and we put the water back in the ground. So we are cooling down. We're, we're putting down cooler water than we take up. So we're, in fact, mining the heat from the ground. Now, the Earth is continuously providing heat from below, so it would be possible to do that in a completely sustainable, renewable way and have it run forever. But that would not be economically attractive because you'd have to have a very modest-sized resource. So the resources, the way they're developed currently, um, these power plants, the ones that the geysers, are about 30 years old, and they're designed, reservoir engineers, which is what I am, design a system so that the plants can be sustained through their life, 30 to 50 years. At that point, um, the resources run down, and that's why you see that down put. That sounds a horrible thing to do, but in fact, because of the heat which is regenerating from below, if you come back 100 years later, you could sort of do the whole thing again. So it's, re it's, it's renewable over a 100-year time frame, uh, but not over 30. Correct. Cool stand. I better quit. So thank you very much. <laughs>